Jim alluded to the fact that uh, that I got involved with the organization back in, in one of its uh, you know one of its dark uh, times, and uh, you know I used to be the only one that showed up to these meetings, so it's it's uh, heartening to see other people here besides myself uh, or people that I dragged here. Uh, but I, I became a libertarian in, uh, in 2001. I was getting ready to join the Army, and I actually I turned them down less than a month before 9-11. And so I like to say that libertarianism you know, probably saved my life. Uh, but I, you know, that's a pretty major shift in, uh, in the path that I was taking. I want to explain what sort of sold me on the, on the idea that, uh, that maybe government isn't the best way to, to solve every problem that we see in society. So uh, I'm going I'm to explain property rights, which, like I said, I'll, I'll explode that further, but that's, that's fundamental to libertarianism. Uh, I'm going to talk about how, they, how that extends not just to, to tangible property uh, you know, that you could sell to somebody else, but also to your own body. Uh, and I'm also going to talk about why it's just a bad idea to have the government managing the marketplace, as well as why it's a bad idea uh, to engage in sort of proactive or rather aggressive uh, foreign, uh, foreign policy. So, uh, so property rights. First of all, uh, property is something that originates naturally. We live in a, in a world where we have scarce resources, right? There's not unlimited amounts of pizza and, and beer and, you know, uh, you know, beach balls and so on and so forth. And so what that means is you have to spend some time and, and effort getting these things together for yourself. And obviously, if you didn't have any right to the stuff that you had gathered or that you had, uh, you know, won with your labor, so to speak, then you wouldn't have much incentive to, to make extra and we wouldn't have the division of labor. And anybody who has taken an economics class understand the division of labor is just where you have different people specializing in the things that they're good at, and that makes everybody better off. You know, uh, you know if, if a doctor's a really good typist, but he's also a doctor, well, it's better for the typist to go ahead and handle the typing and the doctor to handle the doctoring, and, uh, and that way there's more of both to go around. Uh, but, but property rights uh, basically entail three, uh, three types of, of property acquisition. There are three things... Uh, that you can do to acquire property legitimately and be able to call it yours. You can get something given to you, right? And so uh, we all understand that, right? It's the Christmas sort of thing, right? Somebody just gives you something and they're getting some sort of emotional fulfillment, but, uh, but you're getting something material uh, and, and they turned it over to you and so therefore that's yours legitimately, assuming that they didn't steal it from somewhere. Uh, then you've got uh, free exchange and that's where, you know, maybe I've got, uh, you know, a cotton sweater and you've got a pair of shoes and I, and I really need a pair of shoes, and I've just got a surplus of, of cotton sweaters, and you've got all the shoes you can use and then some, but you don't have any sweaters, and it's getting cold out. So, you know, I trade you what I've got, and you trade me what, uh, what you've got, and we both feel like we're better off. So that's a wealth-producing transfer, and, and now I've acquired new property that previously wasn't mine through a, through a uh, voluntary exchange. And there's, uh, there's homesteading. Uh, most people uh, in our generation probably know of homesteading from the postage stamp, you know, with the covered wagon and everything, you know, the big rush to go out and get the land uh, out west when they open it up for homesteading. But homesteading is just when you mix your labor with a previously unclaimed resource uh, and you make it something of value in the marketplace. So an example of that would be you know, claiming gold off the bottom of the ocean or you know, something, something along those lines where it wasn't anybody's before and now you've, now you've expended some effort and you've turned it into something that's actually you know, valuable on the market. Because gold on the bottom of the ocean is not worth anything to anybody, right? It has to be brought to the market to be worth something. And so, uh, so that's the third way that you can legitimately get property. Uh, now, when we say property, we're, again, we're, we're talking about something that you have the sovereign uh, authority over. You, you get to say what happens with it. You know, I, I own this pen, and so if I want to, I can break it in half, or I can give it to somebody, or I can write with it until it runs out of ink and then throw it away, or, or whatever. And I can do any of that stuff because this is mine, and I have the ultimate decision-making uh, authority over, the, over this pen. Uh, so, uh, so we use an example here to sort of explain uh, what the libertarian view of, of government is, if you will, or at least the current... Uh, incarnation of government. Uh, imagine, if you will, uh, this, this is a little audience participation part, so hold on. But uh, uh, imagine, if you will, you're walking down College Street past J&M Bookstore, and you know, you've got a bunch of money in your pocket because you're on the way to buy textbooks, and they're not cheap. And, uh, and all of a sudden, you know, a masked robber comes up and you know, puts a gun in your face and says, hey, give me your money. Uh, OK, so, so we know that generally everybody would agree that that's a crime. Raise your hand uh, if you think that that's a property rights violation, if you will. OK, so almost everybody. Okay, so now, so now we've, uh, we've got the same characters. We're walking down College Street, right? And we encounter a group of masked men. And now they all take a vote, and they say, all right, well, who thinks we should rob this guy? And, you know, it's unanimous. They all want to rob me. And so, uh, and so then they rob me at the point of the gun. Now, now we have a Democratic gang, so to speak. Uh, now, who thinks that is a property rights violation? Okay. Now, I'm walking down past Jane and Bookstore, 
And who do I come across but Bill Ham, the entire city council of Auburn, okay? And, uh, and, they, and they pull themselves together, and they've already had a committee working on this for a while, of course. Spent some money on it already, probably more than they'll get. But anyway, they, uh, they say, okay, well, you know, the committee recommended that we, uh, that we rob this guy. All right, let's take a voice vote. Everybody in favor. All right, put up your dukes, you know. So, uh, so now who thinks that's a property rights violation? All right, now, now you sort of understand how libertarians feel about, about uh, monopoly government. So uh, libertarians are fundamentally anti-theft, basically. We just say that if it's yours, if, you ha if you've acquired sovereign rights over, over a piece of property, either through gifts, exchange, or homesteading, then no one else, period, no one else has the right to deprive you of that sovereignty. That is to say, no one else has the right to transfer your property to themselves. And so, so libertarianism, broken down to its very core, is just being anti-theft and anti-trespassing, if you will. Uh, now, how, how do you get things done then? Uh, and and the, the answer to that is very simple. Libertarians favor user fees. Uh, if anybody in here has read the Constitution, and, and it may or may not uh, be somebody in here who's read the Constitution, everybody's probably read the Bill of Rights, uh, or at least the first part of it. But uh, <laughs> it's, it's a little long, I understand. Uh, but in the, in the Constitution, there were no direct taxes. In fact, in the Constitution, it expressly forbid direct taxation. That is to say, it forbid e income taxes, any, any sort of thing where you're going and, and taking from just an individual uh, you know, at large. And instead, the, the government operations, which, by the way, was mostly just the Navy and the post office uh, and the court system, of course, but government operations were all paid for, I'm, I'm sorry, more than 99% paid for through a low uniform tariff. So basically, per ton, you sailed into Boston Harbor or you sailed into Charleston and you paid a per tonned uh, tariff, and that was effectively a user fee for the Navy. So, you know, the, Na the Navy's going to make sure the port's safe and there aren't ruffians about and so on and so forth. And you pay a fee for that, and depending on how much stuff you're bringing in, you pay more or less. And, uh, and so that, that sort of makes sense. People pay for the amount of, uh, of government services that they're using, and we don't have, you know, the poor guy that lives out, you know, in, in, West, uh, you know, in western Virginia paying for the, for the ports to be kept up because he's not using them nearly as much as somebody who's, you know, sailing in and out with stuff. So, uh, although, of course, he pays into that tariff through the, uh, you know, through the cost of his goods that he buys if they're imported. Uh, so, so we can see, though, that uh, the taxes, or as I say, direct taxes, have not always been the American way. And in fact, uh, you know, the, the era uh, of time that led into our most prosperous uh, uh, part of our history, uh, it was not a, a, ta a period of, of taxation, really, to speak of. By the way, the other, uh, the other decimal place, you know, the other... Uh, less than 1% uh, of what, how government was paid for in 1790 when the, first, when the Constitution was first in effect, those were gifts to the Treasury. People like, you know, saying, oh, well, you know, we're, this government might fall apart any minute. We better, you know, better help them out a little bit. You know, people like leaving their estates and stuff. We don't see that too much anymore, at least not voluntarily. But uh, so that's where the other part came from. But uh, the reason, though, that libertarians favor user fees is the same basic thing. We're anti-theft. We think that, uh, that people should simply, you know, if they, if they want to use a port, they can go to that port and they can agree to pay that fee or they can do business elsewhere. And so that's, that's a lot more legitimate than just going out and, and you know, taking from you know, Peter Paul and, you know, and so forth on the, uh, on the streets who aren't necessarily doing any business there. But th again, this all leads into the idea that legitimacy of actions comes from the consent of property owners. Okay? Legitimacy of actions comes from the consent of property owners. And we see this in you know, the, whole, the formation of our government is supposed to be you know, this idea that you know, the authority of a government justly comes from the, from the consent of the governed. And that's because they own all the stuff. And so if you're going to do something with their stuff, you better ask them first, and you better get their consent. So that's, uh, that's basic uh, you know, libertarian conception of property rights. Now, we understand, of course, uh, you know, how gifts and exchange and homesteading apply uh, you know, to, to backpacks and to hairbrushes and to cotton candy. But maybe not so much with bodies, right, you know, with, with our own bodies, because, you know, of course, we hear all the time about how you know, no man is an island, and, you know, oh, well, you know, the guy who's, who's gambling, he's... He's not actually taking my stuff, but it's making society worse somehow in some sort of psychological sense maybe, or you know, maybe he's promoting you know, a, a greater harm. Or, and, and so we have this idea that maybe we don't really own ourselves. Uh, but of course, everybody's anti-slavery, if you use that word. But, uh, but the body, in fact, is your property, rightfully. And, and of course, the reason for that is because no one else has rightful claim to your body because it's a gift from your parents. The, the physical components of your body were given to you by you know your folks, along with your first you know few uh, years worth of clothes and all your food to get you to this point, right? And uh, and maybe even now into this point. I know I recently just uh, got weaned from that a couple years ago. But uh, anyway, so so we it's, it's pretty clear that that our bodies are a gift from our parents and we own them, 
And, and the reason that libertarians reject, say, slavery is because when someone, you know, if someone enslaves you, they're saying that you don't have the right to, to exert will over your own property. And so it's, it's anti-property rights, and therefore it's anti, uh, anti-liberty. Uh, of course, I guess that's a, you know, you already know that when I say, you know, <laughs> slavery is anti-liberty. But uh, what this leads into, though, is it leads into all sorts of funny positions that make sense if you look at it in terms of property rights. For instance, libertarians don't believe in, in drug laws. Uh, that is to say, coercion over drug use. Libertarians don't believe in seatbelt laws or helmet laws. That is to say, exerting your will through force over someone, uh, over someone else with regards to seatbelts and helmets. Uh, you know, with regards to reproductive and sexual restrictions, we think those are bogus because, again, you own your body. Uh, and so, all of a sudden, it starts to make a lot more sense why libertarians take all these, these seemingly you know, uh, different positions. You know, a lot of people say that we're you know, socially liberal or are fiscally conservative, but no, we're just pro-liberty. We believe in property rights and that we believe that those extend in a very uniform way. And, uh, and so all of these are just the necessary conclusions from that fundamental premise that, that property rights are just. So, so that explains to you why theft is bad and why libertarians uh, think that way. Uh, but, but then you also have the question of, uh, of uh, you know, what, what about the other things that the government does? You know, what about the FDA? You know, they don't, it's not that they're coercing anybody out of, out of money. It's just that they're trying to make the drugs safe. Or... Uh, you know, there are, there are all sorts of regulatory agencies that, that try, and make, you know, try and look out for you. At least that's what they, that, what they claim to do. But um, I mean, and these, are, these are efforts by the government to manage the marketplace, okay, to, to sort of plan the market, if you will. Uh, but there are all sorts of problems that arise from that, and uh, I'm going to go into that a little bit now. Uh, see, the fundamental thing about human action is that people always, always, act in what they perceive to be their best interest. And now, best interest doesn't mean what they perceive uh, you know, that will lead them into riches or that you know, will lead them to a, a date with a pretty girl. or you know, It's not necessarily what I would say would be their best interest, but, uh, but what they perceive at that moment as their highest priority. And so for the heroin addict, that, would, you know, that might be next, uh, you know, his next dose of, of arm dope. You know? but, uh, but, so, but that's what he perceives as his own best interest. And so that's what's important because, again, he owns his body. Uh, but on, on different, uh, in, a, in a different realm, uh, since people act in their own best interests, we have the market uh, representing spontaneous order, where we have a bunch of people who are all acting to get the goods that they need, or, or they think they need, that they want. And, uh, and that's what plugs in all the price information, right? Because uh, the storekeeper knows how much to charge, because if he runs out of stuff too quick, well, he's going to raise the price unless he can get more at a discount or unless he can figure out some other way to do it. But he's going to raise the price to prevent a, a surplus, I'm sorry, a, a shortage. And of course, that's why you know, gas prices go up when you know, Hurricane Katrina tears down a bunch of oil refineries or knocks them out of commission. Because even though there's not a shortage at this present time, people anticipate one, and so prices go up because uh, the, that way the products will be used to their highest valued, uh, to the highest valued ends. Okay, but the, the fundamental problem uh, with, with any kind of government management of the, of the market, though, is that economic calculation is impossible in a socialist state. Now, let me explore that term socialist because sometimes it's just an insult and it doesn't really mean anything, kind of like the word fascist or a bunch of other words that we have. But socialism is where you have government control, or that is to say, you know, government authority over how people do business, more or less. And, and you have, uh, in the United States right now, not, not pure socialism, but we don't have a pure capitalist system either. We have what's called a mixed economy, where you have some uh, industries that are, that are very heavily regulated, and you have some industries that are you know, not so regulated, and then you have some that are they're barely regulated at all, although those, you know, there aren't too many of those in that last group here today. Uh, but, so that's what socialism is. It's, it's social, or that is to say, government control of the, uh, of the means of production and the way that people use them. So uh, economic calculation is impossible in that system for, for this reason. Whenever the government has sole authority or, or that is to say monopoly authority over the means of production, then you don't have the same sort of uh, information inputs that you would have in a free market. Because in a free market, as I already explained, you know, one businessman understands when to raise his lowers prices based on you know, shortage or surplus, but it also is relative to how the other guy is doing. And so you've got people bidding each other down. So you can't, you know, you'd never have a situation in the free market where somebody can, can sell you know, gas for $100 a gallon when it's only costing them 30 cents because somebody's going to bid it down to make it more competitive because they're going to try and pick up more market share. Uh, but the point is that without this sort of competitive bidding going on, trying to, to bid for customers with, with competitive prices or a better product or whatnot, you can't know how to, how to most efficiently bring the goods to the market. And, 
And you know, we see, you know, it took, as you see on the on the commercials, uh, you know, for for a telecom uh, conglomerate, you know, it took what 40 years for us to get anything but a black telephone, right? And that's because it was a big monopoly, and the government had paid for all these lines to be put in, and nobody was really competing with them. And so, as a result, they had no real reason to uh, to do their best to satisfy the consumer's demand, because. Again, you know, they were, they were getting a free ride, more or less, because if you want a telephone service, you can have anything you want as long as it's a black telephone, you know, and that's, you know. And so uh, once competition comes in, though, they start saying, oh, well, maybe people would like, you know, color, you know flesh-colored telephones, you know, or, or pink telephones, or peach, or, what, you know, whatever, or uh, blue. Uh, and so they say, oh, well, you know, the first guys with the black telephone come in and say, oh, well, we better get on this because we're losing some market share. Anyway, you get the idea. So with the, uh, in, the, in the socialist state, though, you can't figure out how many nails you need to produce or how many uh, you know, baby bibs you need to produce because you don't have the same sort of uh, pricing inputs that let you know whether or not you're in a surplus or a shortage situation. And so as a result, you might end up with you know, way more nails than you need, but none of them are, are uh, of the quality that you needed or you know, other sort of problems like that. And that's unavoidable when you only have this monopoly group controlling all the means of production. So, uh, and, and in a mixed economy, Again, we have, we have inputs from the marketplace that allow us to uh, produce things more efficiently than if we were in pure socialism, but we still have a situation where the government is sort of hobbling industry and depriving it of certain uh, data inputs that would allow them to run their business more efficiently and satisfy consumer demand more effectively. So, uh, so the fundamental libertarian position is allow businessmen who actually have their stake in this game, in this endeavor, to take the risks. Uh, don't let, you know, don't have the bureaucrats taking all the risks, right? I mean, it's, anybody who's ever played uh, poker with chips with no money behind it knows that it's, you know, it's, it's not terribly heartbreaking to, uh, to go all in and then lose all your chips if it doesn't represent any money. And, th and yet that's how the, the bureaucrat sort of is forced to look at the resources that they're allocated because they didn't earn them. They didn't bring them together. It was, it, they have a monopoly on these, on these tax monies, and, they, and their job is to spend them and make sure they don't come in with too much money left at the end of the year because their budget's going to get cut. And if they can go over and have some things that they still need, maybe that can get them a raise in their budget the next year. And so those are the incentives that are set up in a, bu in a bureaucracy. Whereas, again, you know, if, if I'm betting my farm on a, on a particular business endeavor being successful, then I'm going to be a lot more careful and I'm going uh, you know, to make sure that, it, that it's a, a good investment before I really literally bet my, my home or all my, uh, all my belongings or, or even just you know, all my money that I have available for investment. And so we see that the incentive structure in a free market is such that people are going to allocate resources, or that is to say they have, enough, they have reason to allocate resources more efficiently and, and, uh, and not just to be frivolous. Uh, okay. So we'll move on to, uh, to defense. And uh, you know, the, the word defense means a lot of things these days. You know, uh, if you're talking about defense in sports, everybody knows what you're talking about. But as soon as we talk, start talking about uh, defense in terms of uh, you know, national security, well, it becomes a lot hazier. And people start talking about, oh, well, maybe we need to go beat these guys up before they do anything to us because they looked at us funny, or you know, somebody wrote a pamphlet, or, or you know, in some cases, okay, they have missiles pointed at us, or you know, there, there are varying stages there. And so, admittedly, it, you know, it isn't quite as, as simple in, in the real world as it is in a football game to tell who's on offense and who's on defense and so on and so forth. Uh, but still, on an individual level, uh, we understand that uh, if someone is attacking us, that is to say, encroaching on our property, whether it's our, our person or our you know, material property, then we have the right to defend it. Now, if somebody's stealing a pack of gum from you, you don't necessarily have the right to gun them down to, you know, to save your property, but you have the right to you know, sort of restrain them from taking your gum, so to speak, or, or whatever, you know, or if somebody's trespassing on your property, you know, maybe give them a reasonable time to walk off you know, on their own accord before you uh, haul out the, uh, the bouncers. But... Uh, in any event, we understand that uh, the people have a right uh, to defense, and that this is inalienable because, as libertarians, we believe that property rights are absolute. And so uh, the right to keep and bear arms, of course, extends from that, an individual right to keep and bear arms, because I own my body, I have the right to defend my body, and therefore I have the right to you know, acquire peacefully, that is to say voluntarily, uh, through exchange or gifts or whatnot, uh, the means to defend myself. And so that's why uh, libertarians are strong on gun rights and concealed carry and so on and so forth. Uh, but on national security, again, this is a hairier issue. Uh, but libertarians come down on the same side of this issue as George Washington, the same side as Tom, uh, Thomas Jefferson, and all of our founding fathers virtually, where we believe in domestic defense, we do not believe in global interventionism. And by defense, we mean keeping people from trespassing on our stuff. Okay? So having the Navy guarding your ports or having uh, you know, police or private security guarding your, your, your tract of land, totally legitimate. Having people going out and exerting force elsewhere on other people's property 
it's not so clear that that's legitimate. And in fact, uh, libertarians would say, generally speaking, that, uh, that it's that's wholly illegitimate when, when we do that with taxes. Because, and, and, and let me explain this, this uh, sort of division here. Now, if it's the case that you've got uh, you know, a, a Pol Pot or a Hitler or somebody who's you know, engaging in mass murder, of course we believe in the right to defense, and, and most libertarians would say that you know, if I walk up on you know, somebody hitting a little baby with a machete or something, I'm a good guy if I stop it, right? And I don't have to know the little baby, or I don't have to have the baby's consent or the mom's consent. I just generally know that if you know, there's a victim, it's pretty clear he's an innocent victim. Here's a guy, pretty clear he's you know, a perpetrator. So I can sort of engage in defense on behalf of the, of the infant and the infant's mom and so on without, without getting any consent. So that part's okay. So it's not that it's, not that it's necessarily wrong to go stop a, a Hitler or a Pol Pot or a Saddam Hussein or somebody. The question is how you do it, what means you use. Because, again, we're not talking about, you know, when, when the U.S. military goes out to do something, we're not talking about a bunch of soldiers who said, all right, well, I got all this stuff together, you know, I got my plane ticket, we're all going over, right, guys? You know, no, the way that it works is, you know, you, you, you get the job that you get in the, in the military, and they issue you equipment, and it's, and it's paid for through taxes. And so even if it is a charitable act or, a, a, you know, a just act to, to go and engage in some sort of, uh, uh, you know, violent intervention somewhere, it's not just to force people to engage in charity because, again, as the property owners, you have the right to determine how you're going to use your stuff. And we'll get into charity more in, a, uh, in just a second. So uh, is it okay for, say, somebody to put together a, you know, a, a foundation to support you know, building a big wall on the Gaza Strip or you know, doing some other sort of uh, you know, foreign intervention type activity, you know, aiding another, another group? Uh, well, you know, it depends, right? I mean, if you're, if you're raising money and sending it to people who you know are murdering people, then no, it's not okay. Uh, although it's okay to gather the money. It's just not okay to, you know, pay people to go murder people. But, uh, but, is it, but you know, for something like, uh, you know, maybe just building up, uh, you know, the body armor that a particular uh, police force has in sort of a crime-prone area or something, is that bad? Not necessarily. But it's just if you, you know, if you force people in Idaho to pay for, you know, stuff in, in Boston, then that's just... It, you're, not, you're not dealing with something that, that involves a user fee. You're just simply basically paying all the taxes into a big pot, and then you're just kind of, you know, all the, all the politicians are competing over uh, who gets the biggest piece of the pie. And so that's, uh, you know, that, the incentive is not there to, to use the resources most efficiently, and plus it's a property rights violation, and so libertarians would say it's both unjust and, and unwise. Um, with regards to charity in general, though, uh, you know, libertarians get a bad rap. A lot of times we say, or a lot of times people say about us, oh, you know, you guys are like the, you know, the cold-blooded Republicans. You know, you guys don't believe in any, in helping anybody. You just in it for yourself, and that's not it at all. Okay, I, and, and maybe it is for some libertarians, just like it is for some uh, Republicans and some Democrats and some Greenies and so on and so forth. Uh, but you know, I, I believe in charity. You know, I've gone out and you know, dished out some food on, on a Thanksgiving day to, to homeless people, and I'm sure a lot of you folks have too, uh, at various times in your life. And so the point is. It's not that, that charity is good or bad. There's, not, you know, there's no value judgment by libertarians on that, although I think most libertarians personally would say it's a good thing. The question is, can you use coercion to take someone's property to do charity? And because that's really what's going on. I mean, if it were, we don't need to have a vote to decide whether you know, some rich guy can go and engage in charity. He can either do it uh, because he wants to or he won't do it because he doesn't want to, and there's no vote involved. Uh, but you know, if, if you're talking about taking money from, you know, say, 30% of the population that's unwilling to kick into a charity or something, I mean, that's just might makes right, right? If you're saying 70% you know, is, is trumping 30%, and so therefore you 30% are going to pay into this charity whether you like it or not. You know, you, and, uh, so that, you know, there's nothing particularly just about that. Again, that's just you know, the bigger guy telling the little guy what to do. Uh, but again, that's, that's the ethical argument. Now, there's also an economic argument. For, uh, for libertarian charity, that is to say non-monopoly charity, non-government charity, and that is that purchasers of charity goods and services, that is to say donors, uh, will do the best job in selecting what relief is most needed. Okay? If, and, and now, this isn't, it, it's not the case that they'll do a perfect job. It's not the case that they'll allocate resources perfectly. It's just that they will do it more efficiently, necessarily so, than, than the bureaucracies will because uh, the free market is just more dynamic and, uh, and again, the incentives are such that you're going to use your resources to, to make the biggest bang. And now, now most people don't really think of, of charities as, as having customers. Or if you do, maybe it's, you know, maybe it's the guy that's coming in and getting the soup. But that's not really the customer. The customer is the guy that's, pay, you know, that's paying you to go out and feed the homeless guys or paying you to you know, have a shelter for, uh, for battered women or whatnot. And so those people 
who may be trying to make a name for themselves or maybe their mom was beat up and they just want to pay into this particular charity or something, you know, whatever. They, they have their own incentives to, uh, to make sure that this, you know, these good acts are getting carried out with their cash. And the, and the key is that with a government charity, the donor can't withdraw his support. And, and that's, that's the important difference because, uh, you know, at a soup kitchen, at Jimmy Hale Mission in, uh, in Birmingham, you know, if you, if you met the, you know, the administrator for Jimmy Hale Mission and he had a Rolex on his arm and he got into a, you know, a Bentley and drove away, you'd think maybe he was, you know, misallocating some, some donor resources or maybe, you know, unless you knew that he was independently wealthy or something. And so chances are, you know, if you're a major donor to that institution and you think that he's being irresponsible, well, you're going to withdraw your support and you're going to, you know, place that support uh, in, some other, uh, in some other area where you think you're going to get more bang for your buck. So, so again, I mean, I think you've all picked up the theme here that, you know, libertarians, uh, it's not just that we're, that we're sort of, uh, you know, reactionary uh, Property rights absolutists, although we are, but uh, but it's also the case that, that we understand that uh, economic incentives uh, in the free market are just necessarily going to uh, result in a more efficient allocation of resources than uh, than government intervention in the market, and so uh, so it comes down to personal freedom and personal responsibility, right? The, it, we should, you know, on an ethical level, we all need to be free. We, we should be free to do what we want with our property, but but we're also uh, you know, sort of weighted down with this personal responsibility. You know, if you misallocate your resources, you know, if you go and you lose all your money in the poker game, well, you know, that's, that's, uh, that's your problem. And maybe somebody will come along with a charity and help you, but nobody has a duty to. That, and, and again, uh, you know, I, I keep talking about things uh, in terms of property rights or in a, in a legal sense. And now, of course, uh, libertarians don't necessarily have the same moral view of, of different actions. For instance, uh, you know, I, I grew up, you know, in a home where both of my parents went to Southern Baptist Seminary, and so, you know, I'm lucky that I, you know, that, that I don't get busted down for dancing, right? But, uh, but you know, certainly, you know, there are lots of there are lots of uh, immoral actions that, uh, that that various folks would say, okay, this is immoral, but that, that's a different thing, though, than saying that it's unjust, okay? And so, and certainly, I would say that it's uh, I would say that it's immoral to uh, you know to get drunk all the time. I'd say that it's immoral to to be very uh, very promiscuous. But but again, that's just my personal. Opinion, and, I, and that shouldn't bear the, sort, the same sort of weight that, that my opinions about what I'm going to do with my property should bear. And, and that's, the, that's the fundamental distinction. So libertarians aren't for drugs, we're not for gambling, and we're not you know, for abortion. Or, uh, and actually, abortion is an issue that's debated by libertarians about whether or not it should even be legal. But uh, you know, we're not for all these things that we're, that we're talking about having freedom with regards to. We're just saying that other people don't have the right to use coercion to, to fix this social problem. You know, the heroin addict... You know, it's a, it's a tragedy to me. You know, I, I'll try and talk the guy out of it. But at the end of the day, he owns his body, presumably he owns the drugs. Now, if he's stealing, you know, he's a, he's a thief, so we deal with him as we do with other thieves. Uh, but, but, but that's the fundamental thing that people need to understand. You know, having, having uh, social morality doesn't require, you know, forcing it at the point of a gun. And in fact, I, I would say that uh, more often than not, if you try and force people to be moral, you're actually going to create more immorality because you're going to equate government edicts with, what you know, what the moral norm is, rather than people just knowing right and wrong, and then you know having it enforced as best as as the uh, market can enforce it. So that's uh, that's libertarianism in a nutshell. Thank you all so much for your patience. And uh, if anybody wants to ask uh, wants to ask any questions, I think the the pizza is going to be here in about uh, about five minutes. So any uh, any questions? Yes. Where's the safety net for disasters? Well, again, you know, when people are know that they're going to have to be responsible for themselves, uh, they tend to be more frugal, okay? Uh, and I, I didn't really get into the, you know, the whole issue of fiat money and inflation and stuff like that, uh, but this it plays a part, and we can talk about that later if you like. But fundamentally, if you're building in a place like New Orleans, where I'm from, actually, I'm from Slidell, which is most famous for getting knocked down by Katrina, but uh, if, if you're living in a place like that, uh, you know, I mean, nowadays, anyway, maybe, maybe it was different at some other point, although probably not much different. Uh, but if you're living in a place that's you know, prone for earthquakes or uh, prone for uh, hurricanes or tornadoes or floods, well, the responsible allocation of resources, uh, I, I would say, is, is preparing yourself for such a disaster. You know, maybe having a, sand, you know, having a bunch of sandbags on hand or uh, you know, so on and so forth. Uh, or, or, and you know, charities would develop over time. And of course, a disaster, uh, you know, or as your insurance company would say, an act of God, uh, is, uh, is not something that, that's based on human action. So, of course, it's harder to prepare for because we can't, we can't necessarily guess when, uh, when nature's going to throw us a curveball, so to speak. But I think that, it's, uh, I, I think that the, the fundamental thing uh, to address your question, though, is just that 
even if it were the case, and, and from economics we're, we're pretty sure that this isn't, but even if it were the case that government could most efficiently prepare for a disaster, it would still be the case that they were taking your property from you without your consent to do it, if they're doing it by taxation, if they're doing it through uh, non-voluntary means. And so, that, so there's an ethical dilemma there, regardless of whether or not there's an economic dilemma. And of course, we'd say there's, there's an economic problem there, too, and a calculation problem. Any, uh, any other questions? Yes. Well, libertarians don't support uh, providing through anything through, uh, through theft. Again, we, we support uh, you know, user fees. And so uh, we, you know, I, I personally think that everybody in this room knows that education is important. And uh, anybody in here, in here who is uh, uh, you know, going to be an entrepreneur, you're going to want you know, good employees who are going to be able to understand your instructions and, and be able to you know, perform at a high skill level, at least you know, if, you're, if you're involved in, in that sort of uh, that line of work. Uh, but uh, so education, I mean, it's not, it's not just that nobody benefits from it except for the recipient. Every, every, everybody benefits uh, from education, so therefore there's an incentive for, for various entities besides the government to provide it. Uh, and before, before uh, you say that that's a bunch of baloney, let me give you a couple of examples of public goods that were provided either mostly or entirely through, uh, through private patrons. Roman aqueducts, okay, and uh, New England uh, lighthouses all along the New England coast. And... Uh, you know, there, there, are, there are a number of other things, too. But, I mean, most people don't realize that, this, you know, one of, these, one of the biggest, uh, most important historic public works, uh, you know, in the, at least for Western culture, you know, the Roman aqueducts, something that, that arguably just changed the standard of living, you know, drastically, was mostly provided for by individual patrons who decided they wanted to have their name on something and that wanted to have their name associated with a particular public work and so got it, got it done. And now... Again, you know, there, I'm not saying that, that's, you know, that the, Rome, the Roman Empire was a bastion of capitalism or anything, because it certainly wasn't. You know, they had slaves, and they, they killed people all the time, and crucifixion is pretty nasty. Uh, <laughs> I think everybody would agree with that. Uh, but, but the point is that even in that situation where you, again, had a mixed economy, where you had some things that the government was entirely controlling, and you had some things that were more or less you know, free market uh, entrepreneurship, uh, you, you still had the incentives in place for people to provide... Uh, provide these public goods. And we can actually see that since uh, the income tax has been instated, uh, which was, well, the first time it was instated was in the 1900s, but it was very briefly. And uh, the first time it was permanently instated was when they passed the Constitutional Amendment at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, and then from the 1950s on, as income tax, uh, well, it went down right there, and then as it raised, we could see that there, there's almost a direct correlation between charitable giving decrease, uh, decreasing and uh, and income taxation uh, increasing. And so if you, if you allow people to, to keep more of what they earn, then they're going to have more disposable income. They'll be able to engage in more charity if they so desire. And some people won't. Some people are selfish. But some people are selfish anyway. I mean, it, it, it really just, you know, it, it's, sort of, uh, it's sort of funny when people uh, you know, talk about, oh, well, we, you know, we've got to make the, the rich people pay their fair share. Well, it, there's something called a Laffer curve. And people dispute this. But uh, this guy named Arthur Laffer, an economist, described this curve of returns on taxation, where the x-axis would be increase in tax level, and then the y-axis would be revenues garnered from it. And what, what happens as you, as you increase taxes, at first you're going to increase your revenue, but at a certain point, and, and nobody can know, that, you know where exactly that point is, but at a certain point, you're going to have your revenues decline because it's going to become more economical to avoid the taxation through tax lawyers or through offshore banking or whatever than it is to pay the taxes. So, so it is actually the case that that as we, uh, you know, as we increase taxation, we can actually uh, impoverish you know, the government agencies that you're trying to support, uh, as well as just really mess up the economy by, uh, by taking away what people are using to provide for their, uh, for their current standard of living. So. Yeah, how do you explain the um, example of Sweden, where they uh, pay pretty much uh, the highest taxes in Europe, but they enjoy one of the highest standards of living in the world? Well, Sweden is, a, is an example that is, is often raised, and I, I believe that the taxation right there is roughly around 70% or something. I mean, it's really high. It might be a lo little bit lower than that, but it's very, very high. But I, as I understand it, you've got you know, education if you want to go, and you know, you can, I, I think that they offer higher education more or less uh, you know, openly uh, to, to anybody who, who wants to take it. But, uh, and, and I'm, frankly, I'm not prepared to answer your question, but I just there's a great article that came out on Mises.org talking about, uh, you know, is Sweden so different? 
And uh, if, you wanna, if you just go to Mises.org, M-I-S-E-S.org, and you just type in Sweden into the search, then, uh, then that article will come up. Now, a couple of things just off the top of my head. Uh, for, for one thing, some people argue that Sweden is more, uh, more culturally homogenous, and so therefore you know, a, a, a communal sort of, a communal sort of uh, means of providing different things might work out better. Uh, I'm not so sure that that's a, that's a strong counter to that. But in any event, the, the article on Mises.org will, uh, will probably answer that better than I can right now. Well, I'd say uh, that's a good question. It's something that I didn't cover. Uh, you know, I'm a Boy Scout. I was, uh, or at least I was. I was an Eagle Scout. I love camping. I love being outdoors. Uh, and, uh, and so as a result, uh, I know that the outdoors is valuable. Uh, now, the, the key thing to understand about environmentalism uh, is that you can be an environmentalist without believing in more EPA regulations. Uh, you know, I would consider myself an environmentalist in the sense that I, that I don't want to see people just going and dumping toxic chemicals everywhere, uh, you know, and I, you know, I, I'm even for the spotted owl, you know, I want the spotted owl to continue to live and stuff, okay. But, uh, but the point is that any time that the government uh, gets involved in trying to engage in, uh, in conservation, uh, I, the problem is that you're talking about a monopoly organization doing it, and you're talking about them not allocating resources correctly, and you're also talking about coercion. You know, if you own a piece of property, uh, if, you were, if we were in the free market and, you know, everything on your property, you know, a bird that flew on your property was yours until it left your property like it used to be, you know, due to British common law and other, uh, other historical uh, traditions, well, if you were the guy that had the land that was like the last habitat of the spotted owl, you'd be filthy rich because, I mean, if... if if it was really that important, right? I mean, and, and we can see that, you know, there are millions and millions of dollars that get pumped into the Sierra Club and get pumped into the World Wildlife Fund and all sorts of, of organizations that receive voluntary donations. So we see that there are a lot of people that are willing to pay for conservation. So we can imagine that if people had more disposable income, perhaps there'd be even more money being poured into these sort of charities. Uh, and as a result, you could, have, you, you could just have people that would outright, you know, buy some of these habitats, or if people could... Uh, you know, could go out and make use of these of, of these habitats. Perhaps they could build something to cater to, you know, to rich, uh, you know, nature lovers. You know, if, you know, come to the only place in the world where you can see the spotted owl. We've got a nice lodge for you, and uh, you know, the habitat's pristine. We've got biologists on on clock, 24 hours, making sure that nobody's throwing their cigarette butts off the trail. And uh, you know, so I mean, I I would argue that that you're actually going to have a a better uh, you know, people are going to be taking better care of uh, of nature, so to speak, of uh, of the you know the wilds, if you will, uh, if they can actually own it. But right now, we have a situation where there's a tremendous percentage of the, uh, of the land area in the United States that is just owned by the government. It's owned by the federal government. A tremendous area is owned by the Bureau of, uh, of, uh, what is it? Bureau of Land Management, I think. That might not be the right, the right uh, acronym. But uh, you know, there are a couple other organizations that own lands here and there. And, but again, it's the tragedy of the commons. It's this idea that, well, nobody owns it. Right, you know, we, or we all own it, but which really means the same thing as nobody owning it, because owning means you get to say what happens with it. So, uh, so, so really, the government owns this stuff, but there's common use of it. So nobody has a real incentive to to take care of it, except for a, a penalty that they might incur. And so you get, you know, you end up in a game where you're, you're slapping people's hands every time they do something bad, instead of just putting them in a position where they have the incentive to do right. And so, I, like I said, I'm an environmentalist, I'm libertarian, I don't believe in the EPA. So. <laughs> Yes, sir. I, I've uh, been familiar with the libertarian platform for a number of years, and I think a lot of what you said is really silly. Um, so I don't, you know, if we were going to debate that, I wouldn't know where to begin. But I've been supporting libertarian candidates for over 15 years. Okay. The reason for that is I'm fed up with the two-party system. In practice, I feel it works scarcely better than a one-party system. You guys have had good success at getting onto the ballot, getting candidates on the ballot in Alabama, and even getting party ballot status. Mm -hmm. um, I'm supporting you because of your effect on our undemocratic ballot laws and restrictions in this state. Well, I absolutely. I, uh, you know, I, I paid for my own ballot access out of pocket, actually. Uh, we, from 2000 to 2002, the Libertarian Party of Alabama was what's called a, a major party. And what that means is we got more than 20% of the, of the gubernatorial returns in, in any statewide race. And in, in our case, it was a, it was a state uh, Supreme Court race in the year 2000, where uh, our candidate got, I think, 20.1% of the vote. And, uh, and as a result, we earned uh, major party status. 
And you know, we, we got to have candidates on the ballot with the little L next to their name and the Lady Liberty next to the straight ticket box that you can check or you know, connect the arrow for. And, uh, and you know, joy of joys, we also got a check box on the Alabama income tax form where you could donate a dollar to the libertarians while you were paying your taxes. And uh, needless to say, uh, not too many folks were in a, in a giving mood while they were paying their taxes, so we didn't see much from that. Uh, but in any event, we, uh, you know, we had that opportunity to get ballot access in 2000 because, because the, uh, the uh, Democrats and Republicans uh, have, have very much gerrymandered the, the, di the legislative districts in the state, and they, and they set it up such that, that they can pretty much guarantee what the, what the partisan outcome is going to be in a particular district. And so you know, District 79, it's a Republican district. It's been a Republican district for a while, and, you know, it's, it's drawn like an octopus. You, know, it, it's, it, you couldn't figure out how, why they would draw it that way unless you started looking at neighborhoods and realizing, oh, they're drawing it so they'll catch the Republicans. And then you know, they draw the other districts to encapsulate the Democrats, and that way you don't really have any districts that are, that are really in play. Uh, and so as a result, you've got tons of, uh, of uh, districts in Alabama, both Senate districts and legislative districts, where there's only a Democrat or a Republican running. There's only, you know, no opposition, and that's because they don't have to compete because they've sewn themselves in so nicely. Uh, and so, of course, the only way this can work is if they restrict the ballot access, if they make it very difficult to, to compete with them at any level, even as an independent. Um, and so in Alabama, you've got to collect, uh, I think it's 3%. I'm, I don't even remember. I, I knew when I had to be doing this, but I think, it was, I think it's 3% of the vote total from the district that you're running in. So statewide, it's 40-something thousand signatures, uh, of which a bunch are going to be illegible. Illeg uh, illegible or invalid because somebody moved before you turned them in or something. And so you really got to spend about $60,000, about a dollar per signature, collecting, you know, say about 60,000 signatures to get a buffer, and sometimes even more than that, depending on how good your petitioners are. Uh, and that's just to get to the starting line, right? That's before you buy your first campaign ad, before you, you hand out your first flyer, uh, or at least before you can, you know, start dedicating all your money toward, toward those sorts of things. Uh, I paid an ounce of gold and three ounces of silver for my ballot access. I paid uh, two guys to come in. I gave them an ounce of gold and three ounces of silver, and they stayed at my house for a week, and they went out on, uh, on Auburn's campus and collected uh, over 1,000 signatures for me. I only needed 405 to get on the ballot, uh, but the Secretary of State uh, kept telling me my, uh, my signatures were illegible. So I was like, well, I'll jump through the hoop again then. And so we got, uh, we got a little bit fewer than 40% uh, of my signatures through a volunteer effort, but again, uh, a little over 60% from, uh, from paid petitioning. So, but now I'm on the ballot and I can actually uh, spend money on, uh, on talking to voters instead of just getting the opportunity to, to be their choice. And uh, you know, we're hoping that we can, we can change that. We've got a few people in the State House and State Senate who are, more, who are interested in lowering ballot, uh, ballot rules, but for the most part, why would they, right? I mean, they don't want to have to compete any harder. You know, it's, right now, they've, you know, it's, like I said, in most, in, I think over a third of the State House races and over 20% uh, of the State Senate races, there's no competition, and they like it that way. Anybody else? I think this is the last question. Yeah. Uh, without business and economic restriction, what makes any difference from the 20s with Lizzie Fair that led to the Great Depression? What's going to prevent something like that? <laughs> you, you, you're going to make me talk about money. Uh, <laughs> well, basically, up in, and I'm, I'll be brief here because I, I think the pizza's here and we need to wrap things up. But uh, up until you know the end of the uh, the 19th century, people uh, you know said dollar, but they really meant. Twentieth of an ounce of gold. Okay, a dollar was just a measure of gold or of silver. Okay, there was we had bimetallism before that. We had, we had the gold standard. There were various sorts of, of commodity standards uh, all throughout. You know, the nineteenth century, there were fights about whether or not you could have a central bank and, and whatnot. And there were major court cases. And uh, somebody in here probably knows more about that stuff than I do. But the problem is that uh, whenever you have inflationary money, and, and right now we do because it's not backed by anything. We had a, we, for a while we had a, a fractional reserve system where there was a certain amount of gold backing up the dollars, and it wasn't fully backed, but you know, it, was, it was high enough to where they figured there wouldn't be a big enough run on the bank to totally bankrupt them. Uh, but anyway, if, had the Federal Reserve formed in the, in the you know, first 15 years of the, uh, of the 20th century, uh, you had the major expenditures in, uh, in World War I, then you, uh, then you go on and there's all, all this sort of progressive stuff going on. A lot of people like to blame Herbert Hoover for being, you know, the, the cause of the Depression by saying, oh, well, you know, he just, he was too free market. Well, you know, Her Herbert Hoover liked to, you know, before he died, he used to like to claim that he, you know, he was the inspiration for the New Deal. He engaged in all sorts of, of uh, you know, market interventions as a Republican. And again, the Republicans were always the tariff party. They were always for higher disuniform tariffs. Uh, and that was, that was true up until FDR, really, when FDR kind of changed directions for the Democrats, and, and they became big government, too. Before that, the Democrats had generally been in favor of smaller government, and the Republicans had been in favor of, of bigger government. So my, my answer to your question, though, 
is that it isn't, in fact, the free market speculators or uh, you know, investors that, were, uh, that caused the Great Depression. It was, it was the boom-bust cycle that is entirely a product of fiat money and inflationary uh, money management by the, by the government. What happens is you get more dollars uh, produced by the Federal Reserve Banks. They get loaned out at lower interest rates. Uh, and so people think that there's more savings available to allocate to various capital investments. They spend a whole bunch of money on capital investment, and there's a boom going on. All these people are employed uh, to build these factories and build all these new, uh, you know, capital goods. And then it sort of equalizes. All, you know, it's supply and demand. With, you ha when you have more dollars, that doesn't mean you have more wealth. You just have more dollars. And so as a result, the value of the dollar goes down relative to everything else. And then you have a bust. A bunch of people get fired. And that, the first hard bust that we had was the, was the Great Depression. And that I believe, and uh, a lot of historians believe, that that is directly the result of, uh, of the inflationary uh, monetary policy of the U.S. government. Anyway, I'm going to shut my trap. Thanks a lot for listening to me tonight. I've got business cards in the back, and I believe we have pizza for you. Thanks a lot. <laughs>